uh, okay, it'll be really easy and you <laughs> will grow a pepper this year. Uh, there's really nothing to it. Um, you can see that uh, over time you can get crazy about peppers. Uh, and I don't mean just being a hot chili head or anything like that, but aren't they gorgeous? Uh, these are little baby pepper plants that are coming into the nursery. Uh, I've sort of segregated the hot ones on my right and the sweet ones on my left. And there may be a couple of duplicates in there, but these each plant is a different variety of pepper, basically. And uh, I, some of you may come from ethnic backgrounds that had cooking that used a lot of peppers. Uh, I did not. Um, if my mother ever knew a pepper, it was probably a green bell pepper. Uh, and uh, that's what I thought peppers were until I had the luxury of eating at a Szechuan restaurant in Berkeley in my college days and not recognizing those little red things in the food until I actually ate one. Uh, and that gave me a whole different perspective on uh, spicy food. Uh, and uh, I am to this day not a hot pepper head, um, but I love sweet to just mildly hot peppers and all the different flavors and uses of them. And have found over the years that they're pretty easy to grow with the exception of some of the very hottest ones that take a long time to mature. Uh, peppers have been used in cultivation and civilization for at least 5,000 years. Uh, there are, there's archaeological evidence of capsaicin, the chemical that makes them hot, um, and pollen from peppers in Peruvian societies that go way, way back in time. Uh, it's thought that peppers originated in the Bolivian Amazon, basically. Uh, and uh, they were small, hot um, fruits that stuck up in the air uh, rather than drooping down. And it's thought that they were designed to be eaten by birds. And then the birds would uh, digest the fruit, uh, but they have a short digestive system, and so they would poop out the seeds along with a little bit of fertilizer and spread the peppers around that way. Uh, it's, the birds aren't sensitive to the heat, the capsaicin, like mammals are. So it's thought that the capsaicin saicin was designed to keep larger mammals from chomping the fruit and crushing the seeds so that it couldn't sprout. Although there's some new theory about how maybe the capsaicin is really a fungicide and that insects that puncture the fruit uh, were letting funguses in and that the plants reacted by increasing the capsaicin uh, and uh, it, it apparently does act as a fungicide. Uh, and has been used culturally as a food preservative as a result. Uh, it, it's also uh, has biological action against uh, bacteria. Um, the uh, thousands, literally thousands of different varieties of peppers that are known today uh, were spread by uh, Portuguese and Spanish uh, conquistadors. Uh, who brought them from the New World uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, since that happened after 1492, uh, by the middle 1700s, when Lamarck decided to organize the names of plants, um, nobody really knew where the varieties had come from. Uh, or very much botanically about the plants. It wasn't much science. So the typical plants that most of the varieties that we grow, such as the bell peppers, the uh, jalapenos, and the uh, 
poblanos, uh, the little lunchbox peppers that you find in the store. Uh, those are all what are called capsicum annuum. Annuum means annual. And it's a misnomer because they're almost all perennial plants that last more than a year if it's not too cold for them. Uh, of course, here it is too cold for them. And if they survive the winter, uh, they end up looking something like this. Um, this is a ghost pepper, which uh, survived the winter on my, well, here at the nursery actually, and is just starting to grow out again. Um, but you can see interestingly that they make a woody stem, unlike a tomato, which is always a fleshy stem but it's starting to make lignin, which is like bark. Uh, and uh, that protects it somewhat from the cold. And so uh, it was able to survive the winter and start to grow out again. And it will probably make a real nice plant uh, after another month or so. Um, and almost all the peppers can do that. If they have some protection during the winter, they may have to go inside to survive, but then they'll come back the next year. And uh, I wanna give a shout out right here, since I'm thinking about it, to a reference on the, on the outline that you should have received to uh, fatali.net, which is a, believe it or not, a Finnish website uh, it, Finland is crazy about peppers, and of course they have to grow them indoors and in greenhouses for the most part because their season is so short. Uh, but uh, on that website, you should look for Bonchi, B-O-N-C-H-I, uh, which is the practice or hobby of making pepper plants into bonsais. And you will find some wonderful pictures of three or four or five-year-old pepper plants with trunks or growing over rocks in the style of Japanese bonsai. Uh, and uh, usually they use the varieties of peppers with the smaller fruits so that they look uh, relatively the right size. Um, but they're absolutely wonderful. And they demonstrate that you can grow these for multiple years uh, before they give up the ghost. Uh, there are about 30 different species of peppers in the world, but only five of them have been domesticated. Uh, and primarily, uh, we use uh, capsicum annuum and capsicum chinese. Uh, chinese means Chinese because again, some botanists went to China, saw a bunch of varieties of peppers there and thought, oh, these must be indigenous to China, but they weren't. Uh, they came from South and Central America like all the other peppers uh, and were developed by Chinese farmers into the forms that they wanted there. And that would be, for instance, the famous habanero, ironically, uh, Capsicum chinese, Chinese, named for Havana, Cuba, habanero, uh, and of course having uh, little to do with Havana and uh, being grown, the type of pepper being grown in China, but not being from China. Uh, I'm not going to take a bite of that. Um, the other Cultivated species uh, include uh, Capsicum frutensis, uh, and uh, there's, there's um, Capsicum uh, baccatum is an interesting one uh, with sort of apple-shaped little fruits that um, grows, um, it, it's used in Peruvian cuisine, and uh, you can you can occasionally find them in the nurseries. Um, it might say manzano on it, uh, meaning apple in Spanish, um, but uh, they're worth a try uh, because they are relatively mild and flavorful and uh, seem to do pretty well in our climate. Um, like tomatoes, peppers have different lengths of time they take to mature a fruit. Um, 
we usually talk about days to harvest from transplanting uh, a pepper that's in this sort of size and age. Uh, and early peppers will be in the 60 to 70 day range. So two months roughly from transplant to having a pepper that you can pick. Um, this little guy already has uh, a flower that's open and you can see the flowers are quite charming um, little guys with um, the white petals and they're self-fertile, um, so they'll fertilize themselves and uh, grow just fine, even without insects, uh, to pollinate them. They don't cross-pollinate real easily, uh, but they will cross-pollinate. Uh, and often to make a specific cross, like a ghost pepper, uh, people will hand cross-pollinate them to get what they want. Um, the mid-range or mid-season peppers would be in the 70 to 80 day range and the later peppers would be more than 80 and up to 120 days. 120 days is a long time. Um, it may not seem like it, it's, it's four months. Um, but that, that days to harvest assumes warmer nights than we have here. Uh, Typically for tomatoes as well, but for peppers, when the temperature gets down around 50, the plants tend to shut down. Uh, they don't, they're not injured by it, but their metabolic processes shut down. And so they stop ripening the fruit during that cold period and they pick up again when it warms up during the day. That slows down the process. If we had nights like the Central Valley that are in the 70s, uh, they would keep ripening right through 24 hours a day and you'd get peppers quicker. And you could grow the longer season peppers. Most of the super hot peppers are in that longer season range. Uh, and so if you want to do that, um, get started early and be very patient. And um, by October, you'll probably have some ripe peppers. Um, now, peppers uh, are, are easy to grow from seed. Um, I, I do it a couple of different ways. Uh, and um, I went to the market today and bought some dried peppers just to bring them along. Uh, this is a Cascabel pepper uh, from Mexico. Uh, let's see, I got them wet. So there we go. You can hear this maybe. Those are the seeds rattling inside the little pepper, it's dried. Um, uh, in the typical uh, Mexican market, you will find many, many varieties of dried peppers. And drying the peppers brings out, it concentrates the flavor, essentially. Uh, and uh, they uh, can be reconstituted by soaking them for a little bit, maybe half an hour in some warm water. Uh, and then they're very usable again. So peppers uh, can um, be dried to last through uh, a season when you can't eat them fresh, um, just like we might can something or freeze something, but uh, without the technology to do that, um, traditionally they're dried uh, and then used either ground like pepper or ground it as a garnish or in sauces or reconstituted and, and cooked that way. Um, the basic growing method that I use for peppers is to buy them, if I don't grow them from seed, buy them at the nursery in this size, which is a three and a half inch pot or a four inch pot, about this size. Sometimes they're available in a gallon pot, that's this size pot, quite a bit bigger. Um, this was one, by the way, that also uh, overwintered. Um, this is a, um, what is it? It's an orange spice jalapeno, be interesting. Um, and it made it through the winter and it's starting to grow out nicely. Uh, have some little spots of good solid green growth and a few buds forming. So it's gonna make it. Um, 
But if I start with this size, uh, I can um, transplant um, this three and a half inch pot into something like a one gallon size, or lately I've been using two gallon uh, containers. That's this size here. This is one I brought from home, which is a Italian long, they call it. Um, it's already got fruit on it. And it's already not only have blossoms, but it's got a nice little fruit forming here. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is just a two gallon container. Um, you never really need to go larger than a five gallon container for peppers, um, unlike tomatoes, which I think need 15 gallons. Um, but this, for instance, is a five gallon nursery container. Uh, and the, the uh, paper pot there is about the same size. That's a plastic pot over there that would be fine. And this, this one's a little bigger, but it would work fine. Um, and uh, of course, a ceramic pot uh, would be dandy uh, or terracotta. Um, just keeping in mind the terracotta dries out rather quickly. And so you'll have to water more often with a, with a terracotta pot. Um, plants do not mind the plastic, um, by the way, um, and the pots are reusable year after year uh, until finally they'll, they'll give up the ghost, but they last quite a long time. Uh, the paper pot up here is designed that you can plant it in the ground after you have grown things in it above ground for a while, and it will decompose in the ground and the roots will grow right through it. Um, but above ground, they'll last for, oh, at least three seasons usually uh, and are uh, relatively cost effective, um, although they don't last as long, obviously, it's a ceramic pot. Um, peppers uh, are a little less hungry plants than tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes are heavy feeders throughout their uh, growth cycle. Um, peppers basically grow uh, to a certain point and then they start to flower. Uh, and they flower on the ends of the branches. Um, so they, it's called terminal blooms. Uh, and then uh, they have to branch out under lower than that spot because they bloomed at the end of the branch. Uh, and so then you can see here, uh, this one, this big flower that's about to open came right at the end of this stem. And then it's had to send these two branches out underneath the flower. Uh, so that's the process. And then these have already set buds. So now it has to send out more branches. As a result, peppers are in general, aren't a, a long viney plant because it's, it's a sort of a geometric progression. Every time you end at a, at a bud, you end up with two branches. And each of those two makes two more and two more and two more. And so very soon, uh, you've got a multi-branch little shrub. Uh, and as a result, uh, it's, it's a relatively tidy grower uh, and it doesn't need a lot of pruning uh, and it will suddenly have many, many blossoms and start to make many, many fruits. Now, as a result, they've developed a sort of self-protective mechanism that says, well, you're making too much fruit, you're taking too much energy, uh, now I'm gonna stop blooming. And so uh, if you allow uh, a pepper plant to set all the fruit that it wants to, it will do that and then it will stop uh, and rest. And so the way to cajole them into continuously producing for you at a relatively smaller volume is to pick the fruit in different stages as it grows along. Uh, all peppers start out green. This is a serrano, a little too hot for me, but a wonderful pepper. Uh, and this is its green form. And then 
uh, I found that the market, one that was starting to turn, and you can see the beautiful color uh, of the Serrano, and in time, it will all be red uh, like that. And that's true for all peppers. They will start out green or almost white and then develop as they ripen into a color. Uh, the most typical are red. Um, some of them, um, like the uh, ancho or poblano here, will turn almost a brown color. It's a really pretty uh, dark, dark green fading, uh, sort of moving toward brown um, as its matured color. Um, and, uh, and then when they're dried, uh, uh, this is a guayillo pepper, uh, which is a relatively mild, slightly spicy, but a pretty mild pepper. Uh, with a wonderful kind of fruity, earthy flavor that's used in uh, guayillo sauce um, and moles. Uh, and uh, uh, wonderfully fragrant, almost almost smells like, you know, if I were a wine taster, hints of <laughs> leather and- uh, Mahogany. Yeah, mahogany, <laughs> yeah, 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 things like that. Um, it has a wonderful complex flavor to it. Uh, and um, uh, anyway, uh, you, you pick fruit as it grows so that uh, you have some of them maturing to full flavor and color and then eating some of them or use cooking with some of them uh, when they're green so that the plant will continue to produce for you. Um, I usually will set out about half a dozen um, shishitos um, or shishitos, um, which is a wonderful um, Japanese uh, pepper that you can find in the supermarket, uh, usually in a clamshell. Um, and uh, these are these are interesting because the the basic shishito will be about ninety percent of them will be a sweet pepper um, with good flavor. Uh, and uh, no heat, and then about 10% of them will have a little pop to them, uh, and you can't tell which ones are going to be which. So uh, at home, when I use these, I, I, I'll i have a half a dozen plants on the deck growing, and I'll go out in the morning and pick eight or ten and uh, to chop up to put in the scrambled eggs, and uh, I carefully... Uh, taste each one as I go because I have a partner who does not uh, appreciate the spiciness. And uh, so I just do it that way. And there are like, there's a, uh, a variety of shishito called Takara that has no heat in any of them and is growing uh, fairly, uh, uh, I think most of the growers now are growing that because I've experienced fewer and fewer hot shishitos. Um, Padron from Spain, uh, Pimienta Padron, uh, is very similar uh, and about the same percentage of hot peppers uh, to sweet peppers. Um, and they even look very similar, um, but they're from different parts of the world. And uh, again, Padron is a very popular pepper and uh, very nice for eating green and fresh. Um, the shishitos and padrones will mature red, um, but for the shishitos especially, by the time they turn red, they start to dry and pucker. And so almost always you use the green uh, unless one happens to get away from you and turns red and is still nice and uh, fleshy and fresh. Um, so that's why you always see them green. Um, so planting peppers, um, um, first of all, a good location. You want a nice sunny spot. If anything, more heat than you have available even for your tomatoes. Um, I have a deck which is too hot for tomatoes, but the peppers love it. Um, and uh, um, a good potting soil or mix in compost and a little bit of manure into the soil if you're planting in the ground. Um, uh, 
they do not eat as much nitrogen, for instance, as a tomato does. Um, so I would use, and I usually recommend about four parts compost or three parts compost to one part manure for tomatoes. And I would up that to about six to one for the peppers uh, so that you don't over fertilize them. Um, add a little bit of a balanced uh, fertilizer just to make sure that you've got adequate micronutrients and calcium. Um, I, I have not suffered from blossom end rot on peppers the way I have occasionally on tomatoes, um, but the calcium is helpful to make sure that it's adequate so you don't get blossom end rot. Um, and uh, just um, give them uh, in the ground, give them a good deep soak at the time of planting, and then about once a week, a good deep soak. Um, their roots will grow relatively quickly. Uh, they have good, strong, fleshy roots. Uh, let's take one here that's relatively large and pop it out of its container. And you can see it's already filled up the container with the roots and uh, is ready to go into something bigger and expand in all directions. Um, unlike tomatoes, peppers don't readily grow roots out of the stem. And so there's no real advantage to burying them um, deep. Uh, it won't hurt them, um, but uh, tomatoes actually, you'll get a better root system by doing that but uh, there's no evidence that it's helpful with uh, peppers. How many hours of sun do they need, would you say? <laughs> well, full sun is considered to be sun between about 10 a.m. and about 4 p.m. Um, that's ideal. Um, the sun before that and after that is relatively weak and doesn't really give them the energy they need to photosynthesize. Um, so um, I, I would say a minimum of four hours during that 10 to 4 period. Um, with less than that, the plant will grow, but it's not going to produce much fruit. Um, it takes a lot of energy to produce uh, the, not just the physical structure of the pepper, but all the sugars and complex chemicals that are associated um, with the flavors that you have in there. And all that energy has to come from the sun. Uh, things like fertilizer don't do anything except support the growth of the structures and, and the photosynthesis. All of the energy that converts uh, things into proteins and sugars comes from the sun. And so without that, uh, most fruiting plants uh, and trees require that full sun in order to produce enough energy to uh, ripen the fruit uh, and have good flavor. Um, often you'll get insipid fruit um, because you don't have enough sunlight. Uh, so uh, that's really the answer. Um, I'm gonna go over to the um, mobile potting bench over here. That's what we're calling it, mm -hmm. the mobile potting bench. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I want to plant this little guy first, um, just to show you the technique that I use um, for planting a little plant like this. Um, I've already got some soil in here, and but it's not quite enough because it would end up way down there. So I'm going to add a little more soil and as you can see I'm not particularly itsy poo about getting my hands dirty but um, gloves will protect your hands um, adequately. Um, now that's going to be about right uh, and then I'm going to add a little bit of fertilizer. This is uh, an organic fertilizer by E.B. Stone, which if you've ever shopped at a Slope Garden Center, you've probably been encouraged to get some Sure Start. Um, it's a fertilizer that contains uh, a lot of beneficial fungus, funguses and bacteria. 
uh, which we know through research is incredibly important to root development and the exchange of nutrients from the soil to uh, the plant roots. Now, I'm just sprinkling in about, um, I would say that was about a tablespoon and a half of the fertilizer, and I'm gonna mix it in to the top few inches. So it's ready when the plant grows into it. And the, the potting soil is already moist out of the bag. If it were bone dry, um, I, I would mix water with it right in the bag and uh, you'd have to massage it and get it nice and wet. Um, it, it would have to have been sitting around in your garage for years for that to happen. So it's almost always moist. Then um, this is a, a lunchbox orange that's like the little uh, peppers that come in the packages at the grocery store, sweet pepper. And I like to use the uh, label uh, to score the roots a little bit. Um, this not only breaks the pattern that the roots form as they grow around in the pot, but it also uh, increases the surface area of the soil and the root ball so that there's going to be more little nooks and crannies for the new soil to join with it. Um, because we want them to become one over time. And these roots that are just kind of hanging down there, I'm going to snip off so that I have a nice, neat root ball that's ready to grow out into the new soil. And I'll stick it on there. And then the bag of soil is over here. I'm actually going to take some more fertilizer, another you know tablespoon or so, and mix it into the soil right here so that when I put more soil in, it's got some fertilizer in it already. And although there are fertilizer elements in the potting soil, this is the uh, sloped organic potting soil. And it's got things like, uh, oh, bat guano and various things that are fertilizer elements, but I like to add a little bit of balanced fertilizer to make sure that I've got a good mix. I can do a little bit wacky wacky there and I've got a plant that's ready to grow up and be a big pepper and then I make sure that I put the label in it's kind of hard to see but it's like an inch below the rim about an inch below the rim yeah they're both dark aren't they? mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I even remembered to put them on a saucer so that I don't get all of that here as they usually do <laughs> Uh, and then just well, water it in thoroughly. Uh, and then it'll need watering again in a few days when it starts to dry out. But it can go right out in the direct sun and be perfectly happy uh, and uh, is ready to rock and roll. Now, as it gets a little larger, like this one in the similar size pot, um, they don't need a lot of, you can see that they're upright growers and they don't need a lot of staking, but I like to put one stake in just to make sure that I don't, you know, knock it for a loop and break it off or something like that. And so I just put the one stake in, take a little piece of tie tape, or in this case, twine, uh, and tie it to the stake so that it's safely anchored uh, and then it can grow the whole season with just that single stake. Um, there are also uh, little mini tomato cages that are sold uh, and we call them pepper cages and they work great to help keep a pepper upright. Um, and then uh, you don't need much of a stake so I'm just gonna cut it off there so it's hardly even visible. And that'll go for the whole season with the, little single steak in it and be just fine. If, if for some reason it sends out a wild shoot that seems to need some support, then I can always put another stick in and support it that way. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's really all there is to it. And um, when, um, uh, when it sets some fruit, um, you can fertilize it again lightly 
um, but it should always be lightly. And um, either that means sprinkling a little bit of the dry fertilizer on top and scratching it into the surface and watering it, or if you want to use a soluble fertilizer like the, um, this is Max C, which is pretty popular. Um, this is the all purpose Max C. Uh, 16, 16, 16. What's that mean? Uh, means equal percentages of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, which are the macro nutrients for plants that they all need. And uh, it also has seaweed in it, and which provides a lot of micro minerals that plants need as well. Uh, and this is not an organic fertilizer, but it's a high quality fertilizer. And it's used at the rate of about one tablespoon of the powder per gallon of water in your watering can and then give them a good watering. And you could do that once a month with peppers and it, they'd be very happy. Um, oyster shell, if you, um, think that you need extra calcium, oyster shell is a good source. Um, Eggshells are not a good source of calcium for the plants, um, even though they're calcium, uh, unless you were to grind them up into a very, very fine powder, um, they take years to decompose to the point where uh, they'll release the calcium to the plants. Um, so while <clears throat> they're good to throw in your compost or whatever, um, just keep in mind that that's a, a multi-year process for uh, getting the eggshells into a useful form. Um, lots and lots of peppers are available in seed form. I laid out some of the ones that we carry here at our particular store. Um, some of the more interesting ones. You'll notice I, I don't have a bell pepper here because I know we all know what a bell pepper is. Um, but, you know, there are some interesting ones. This is a Japanese san, santaka, which is a hot pepper that grows upright on the plant, kind of like, let's see, uh, kind of like this. This is the sort of the original way peppers grew. Um, this is a Thai dragon, um, which is a very fiery, hot Thai pepper. Um, and you can see how the little pepper is growing just straight up. And many of the ornamental peppers that you'll see around Christmas time uh, are selected as ornamental peppers because they grow upright like that on top of the plant and make a nice show. And uh, they'll have multiple colors of peppers as they ripen um, to decorate the front stoop or whatever. Um, there's a real interesting little sweet pepper that's available these days called Eco Eco, I-K-O, I-K-O, uh, which goes through an amazing color transformation, starts out a, a deep kind of purpley color and then matures into different shades, uh, yellow, orange, red. And so as the plant grows, you'll have all those different colors on it at the same time. And it's quite a tasty little um, sweet pepper. Um, now, the, the botany of uh, peppers tells us, and, and experience tells us as, as well, that the entire pepper doesn't all have the same hotness to it um, if you're dealing with spicy peppers. Um, and the, um, you know, the, the, the biology of the peppers is all the same, so it doesn't matter which one I pick here in a sense. This is a sweet pepper, but um, I'm gonna cut it in half and open it up. And you can see the seeds are up here. It's not a heavily seeded pepper. And these uh, fleshy white parts are the placentas that the seeds are attached to. And it's these placentas that have the lion's share of the capsaicin in them. And so if, you, if a pepper is a little too hot for you, if you remove the placental material and the seeds, which are usually pretty hot too, then the flesh 
will have less of the heat in it um, and maybe be more palatable for you. Um, now, if you get into the really hot peppers like the habaneros, that their flesh is pretty darn hot. <laughs> and so uh, you just, you know, be forewarned. And of course, uh, heed, heed that if you work with a hot pepper with your hands, uh, you don't want to touch your eyes or your nose or your mouth necessarily or unnecessarily. Um, now, over the years, uh, I mean, a jalapeno is not a jalapeno is not a jalapeno. Uh, there are really hot, well, for me, pretty hot jalapenos, and there are perfectly mild jalapenos. And uh, they uh, are grown that way on purpose uh, and sometimes labeled appropriately so that you can find a jalapeno so that you can taste the flavor of the jalapeno and not necessarily get the hotness of it. Uh, and they will usually say that they are mild or sweet jalapenos on them. There are also early jalapenos, which mature quicker and are better to grow in our area. Um, and uh, this, for instance, is an early jalapeno right here. And the label says early jalapeno. Uh, and it says uh, 75 days. Um, so that's yeah. relatively early for a jalapeno. Let's put it that way. Um, some of the uh, sweet peppers will be the earliest maturing. Um, my personal favorites are the Italian sweet peppers. Um, and uh, of those, the Jimmy Nardello, um, I don't have any mature examples here, but it's a long skinny maturing to red Italian pepper, um, which is uh, remarkably sweet and remarkably flavorful with a very thin skin and is wonderful to either eat fresh or to saute uh, or barbecue either in you know slices or chunks or whole um, and they've become available at some of the markets I know the good earth has had them over the years um, and some restaurants you'll find them as an hors d'oeuvre. Um, they'll saute them in olive oil and uh, serve them whole as an hors d'oeuvre. Um, <clears throat> I know uh, Pizzolina in San uh, in Selmo is an example of that. Um, but they don't always have them because they're not always in season. Um, the um, other, the other really flavorful, sweet Italian peppers are uh, the bull's horn, Cornu de Tornel. Uh, the Bergamo uh, is often available, uh, and the giant red Marconi. Um, and those are all equally easy to grow and remarkably tasty. Um, there's also peppers that grow more upright uh, called um, tree peppers, if you will. Um, in Spanish, Chile de Arbol. And uh, they're kind of fun to grow just because they're so different and they come from the Andes and they're a little more cold hardy. That doesn't mean they can take frost, but they are, they're a little more cold hardy. Um, most of them are pretty hot. Um, and uh, but, but really fun to grow. And I, I would encourage people to grow peppers both to eat and just uh, as an ornamental um, because as the fruit ripens, it's just wonderfully pretty. And um, you can um, decorate your household with them. Um, you can bring them in for periods of time. Uh, and they'll grow fine indoors for you know a week or two, uh, and then put them back outside so that they get more light. Um, let's see. So it's not too late to start seed. Oh no, no. Uh, of the earlier varieties, uh, 
um, it's certainly not too late. I don't know that I would um, start a habanero this late necessarily. Um, you'd really want to start that indoors in uh, about March uh, and get it going. But for most of the relatively early sweeter peppers, it's, it's not too late at all. Um, I, I should talk a little bit about growing bell peppers because although I, I don't personally grow them, I find them insipid. <laughs> um, um, but um, you can certainly grow them successfully. Um, the, the problem people usually have is they get one giant pepper, the first one, uh, and then the plant tends not to produce too much um, after that. Um, and so one of the techniques is to let them set a little bit of fruit and then pinch those first fruits off and throw them away uh, when they're quite small. Uh, and somehow that tends to encourage the plant to ripen more evenly uh, the remaining fruit. Uh, and uh, of course, bell peppers, um, um, cow wonder is probably the most common green pepper that you see in the store, green bell pepper. Um, if you let that ripen on the plant, it will be a red pepper. Um, the orange peppers and the yellow pepper, bell peppers that you see in the store were green peppers until they ripened. Um, and um, they don't take on the sweetness that they can have until they ripen. Um, green bell peppers tend to be relatively flavorless and not very sweet. But if you let them fully red, orange, or yellow up, they'll have a lot more sugars in them and they'll be more fruity tasting and, and um, sweeter. Um, but again, it, uh, it takes a lot of energy to do that, to make those big fruits. And you will probably have more success and find that you can use them in more ways if you grow the, the smaller Italian type sweet peppers, if you like sweet peppers. Um, than trying to grow bell peppers. Um, bell peppers tend to grow out in the Central Valley where it's nice and hot and the warm, the, the evenings and nights are nice and warm. And so you can uh, ripen up those big old uh, peppers easily. Um, yeah. Hey Dan, I got some questions kind of relating to that yeah. actually. Um, yeah, I think you're, you mentioned it earlier on, but someone was talking about um, more specifically, but also could be related to other areas, but the warmer parts of San Francisco, I know by the coast, it's sometimes a little bit harder, but the warmer parts of San Francisco, can you grow most of the, belt, the most of the peppers or are there some varieties you should really go towards or um, do you think? Uh, again, that? yeah, I, I would go for the earlier peppers. Um, so that's gonna be the smaller peppers basically. Um, anything from uh, early jalapeno, uh, the lunchbox types, the Italian sweet peppers, um, yeah, it probably could grow serranos. Um, and uh, you could try something like an Anaheim. This is an Anaheim here. Um, Anaheims are moderately warm uh, New Mexico peppers. Um, and uh, I think any of those should do fine. The shishitos would do fine in the warmer parts of San Francisco. Um, shelter from the sea breeze, um, yeah. maybe a, uh, a, a wall behind it that gets some warmth uh, will be helpful uh, in all those circumstances now. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, uh, some people were asking about planting multiple peppers in one area and, and you're suggesting generally one pepper for like a pot, like a five gallon pot. But if you have a longer planter bed or in the ground, how close can you plant them together? Is that going to cause problems? 18 inches to two feet is a good rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> they don't get huge. Um, if you, you know, if you gave them three feet, they would probably never touch each other. Um, it won't hurt if they touch each other. So yeah, 18 inches to two feet apart and uh, uh, multiple peppers together will be fine. They, the fruit won't be affected by different kinds of peppers being nearby. It's only the next generation that's affected by 
cross pollination. Uh, yeah, I was actually gonna ask that. Do they can they do some cross pollination? Like they're like kind of hybrids will form. I guess you have to plant the seeds to see it, but yeah, they they can and uh, and do. I'm sure. Uh, uh, but as I say, they're mostly self-pollinating, and mm -hmm. so uh, even though the bees will visit them, they don't do a lot of the pollinating for them. They, they, a plant tends to pollinate itself, uh, and so it, it lives with the genes that it has, uh, and they may get expressed a little differently if you grow the seeds from it the next year. Um, but you're probably not going to get a lot of strange hybrids um, just uh, by growing the plants together. And, and if you if you did, that would be wonderful. Um, you'd have a science experiment going. Um, yeah. yeah. But again, it, it, it's never the current generation that's a problem. My, my father said, don't plant watermelons and pumpkins in the same patch because you'll get pumpkin melons. <laughs> well, that doesn't <laughs> happen. That doesn't happen because even if they cross pollinate it, it's the genes of the parent plant that are producing the fruit. Um, and the cross pollinization genes are going into the seeds for the next generation. So, hmm. not Is there any, because um, we're talking about them being next to each other, it's not that big of a problem, but are there any um, diseases and stuff you kind of have to start worrying about? I know tomatoes tend to have a little bit more that we talk about, but are peppers susceptible? Tomatoes have a lot of diseases. Peppers have very few. Cool. Uh, one of the diseases that I have run into uh, is uh, rats. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this this is an animal repellent, which ironically uh, is capsaicin and other capsinoids. So we're using hot pepper spray to keep the rats off of the hot peppers uh, because the plants don't have much capsaicin in the leaves. And in my experience, the rodents love to eat the leaves of the plants and they'll chew them right down to nothing. Uh, and if there are fruit, if there's fruit on a hot pepper, they'll leave the fruit and eat the rest of the plant. Um, so uh, I like the idea of keeping <laughs> keeping the rats away with a little capsaicin uh, because they really don't like it. Uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that's one disease uh, that you'll have. They, they, they are subject to blossom end rot, um, which is a, a, a strange disease where uh, the, the, this is the stem end and the blossom was on this end before the fruit developed. So the, the blossom is out here. Uh, and blossom end rot is a softening and it, it turns kind of a, an ugly tan color uh, and, and is kind of soft and watery looking. Uh, and it's a, it's a lack of calcium in kind of a strange way that the, the calcium, there may be calcium, but it's not available to the plant. And, uh, uh, can sometimes be um, ameliorated simply by waiting and the plant will absorb enough calcium so the next group of, of peppers or tomatoes won't have it um, or you can um, add calcium uh, with a product like Foley Cal as a foliar spray. Um, but um, usually it's not a serious problem and uh, insect and, uh, and fungus disease-wise, uh, uh, peppers are really uh, pretty uh, simple. Um, I have not had so much as an aphid um, on my peppers ever uh, that I remember. Um, and although I'm sure there are chewing insects that chew on the leaves, um, for instance, that there's some evidence of a chewing insect having nod on this leaf <clears throat> maybe from the brown edges i would say it was uh, several weeks ago um, but it didn't do much damage to the plant and if i find a hole like that um, i say more power to you chewing insect um, 
and I hope that a bird ate you and fed you to its babies. Because um, <laughs> after all, if, if there are no insects, there are no baby birds. Uh, so I, I like to share my leaves to some reasonable extent with the insects that then feed the birds. Um, <clears throat> I, I do not care about perfectly formed leaves. Um, if I found that they were all being skeletonized or like that, I, I would, I mean, I hope that when you grow plants, you go out and look at them regularly. Uh, and that way you can see when damage is starting to happen and you can look mostly under the leaves and try to see if you can find the critter, the type of critter that's bothering the plant at that moment. But the, the fact is the critters move on relatively swiftly. And um, by the time we see most of the damage, they've already gone off to the next generation. They, the caterpillar has become a moth or a butterfly or the, the beetle has moved on to, you know, underground and waiting for next year. Uh, so, uh, and since these days insecticides tend to be only insecticides that we can uh, spray right on the insect to do anything, uh, they don't have residual effects anymore. Uh, unless you can see it, there's not much point in worrying about it. Frankly. Yeah, and uh, if you if you're starting to see it, I've always recommended people go out at nighttime. I know it's kind of weird sometimes, but check the plants at nighttime. You'll most likely find them around then. Well, with that flashlight, and that's when they're more active. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, snails and slugs uh, can conceivably be a problem, and those are relatively easily controlled with a bait like uh, Sluggo, which is. Um, approved for organic gardening and uh, is an iron compound um, that kills them when they ingest it um, and doesn't leach in anything nasty into the plants. Um, and uh, otherwise, I, I don't think you're going to find very many problems with the peppers. Um, by the end of the season, um, the peppers are still looking good. Uh, they may have stopped producing by the end of October or so, but they look fresh and green and the tomatoes are all wilted and fungusy and you're going, God, if, uh, I think I've added the, the tomatoes. Um, but that won't be the case with the peppers. Uh, you'll say, oh, I wish I could keep them for the winter. Um, but it's hard to do. They're very, very cold sensitive. Once it gets down under about 40 degrees, they start to... Uh, lose their uh, joie de vivre, and um, if it if they get frosty at all, they'll die. Uh, so you have to protect them during the winter. Um, let's see. I promised in the outline that I would show you the uh, plastic bag and uh, paper towel methods for starting the seeds. So I'll do that very quickly. Um, <laughs> it's so easy. Plastic bag, paper towel. Uh, squirt bottle to moisten or faucet if you're in the kitchen to moisten the paper towel. Seeds, I think I'll start, oh no, I think I want to start some Pasilla Bahio, a long Mexican, sounds like a yummy pepper. They don't give you very many seeds in these packets, I'll tell you. So I dump the seeds out into the paper towel, fold it over. So they're inside and they're moist. And I stick the paper towel into the plastic bag. Seal it up with about an inch of airspace so it can breathe. And then I place this on top of the refrigerator. Why? Because the temperature on top of your refrigerator is perfect. The warm air that's created from making the inside of the refrigerator cold keeps these at a little over 70 degrees all the time, even at night. Uh, and in a week, they will have sprouted. 
And then I carefully unfold the paper towel and take the little seedlings and put them in a pot and let them grow. So that's a real easy way to do it. Another real easy way is with these little heat pellets, I put corn, so they, they come, when you buy them, they come like this, either in a tray or separately, but they're desiccated here. You pour about a cup of water on them and they swell up like this. And then you just, they come with a little plastic netting around them. So you just kind of peel that back and then put two or three seeds into the little hole in the middle of it and cover it over with a little of the peat like that. Put the little roof on it. A greenhouse. Yeah, it's a little greenhouse. And the, the only trick is don't put it in direct sun, keep it inside. Don't put it in direct sun, it'll get too hot. Um, but you just put it in a sunny, uh, not a sunny, a light location. And in a week, you'll see the little sprouts coming up. And then you can just take the whole peat pellet and stick it in a little more sizable pot and let them grow for a while. And the roots will go right through the netting uh, and uh, like that there. And away you go. Uh, so that's a really easy way to start seeds. They work really great too. I've actually done a lot of beans and stuff in those little um, greenhouse pods. And we, we definitely sell those small ones. We sell large ones if you want to start a whole bunch at once. Um, we even sell all the components, so the trays, and then those little peat pellets. We sell them separately too, so you can refill your, your older ones that you have. So definitely a great option. Yeah. Good yeah. for kids too. Easy way to do it. Um, so uh, let's see. If, if any of you want to... Uh, Pop a jalapeno, here you go. And uh, I, I personally am not going to do that. Um, but uh, if there are any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. And if not, um, uh, yeah. I, I, I want to encourage you to grow an array of peppers. And uh, I, I put all the super hots over here. So uh, we have a section here at the nursery called Austin's Super Hot Pepper Department. Uh, because Austin is a foodie and, and likes really hot stuff. Um, but we have the Scotch Bonnet, the uh, Trinidad Scorpion, the Ghost Pepper, uh, and other really spicy ones. This is an interesting one from Flatland Flower Farm called Diablo, which means devil, Diablo, same root. Um, and although it is a capsicum annuum. It doesn't look like the rest of them. It's fuzzy uh, and it has a little tiny hot pepper. Um, Manny, who is, uh, his family is in Mexico, who works at Flatland, brought this up from Mutual Con. And uh, the peppers are too hot for Manny, apparently, but Manny's wife loves them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's about it for today. Yeah. I have a, um, Thank you yeah, all. just before we, we end up, I have a, some quick questions here and there. Um, first one, which I think you answer pretty fast, can you plant a pepper and a tomato together? Oh, sure. No, no problem at all. Um, Give them the space, I would say. Well, the, the tomato, depending on the tomato plant, they can get very big um, if you're successful with them. So you want to give them room. Um, I, I think a tomato should have about a three foot diameter. So plant the pepper outside of that diameter. The, the, the tomato is going to outcompete the pepper um, yeah. for, for resources. Um, but it, otherwise, they can grow together. The, the, you, you don't want to grow tomatoes and potatoes together because they share all the same diseases. But since peppers don't really get many of the tomato diseases, it's, it's, that's not a problem. Yeah. Cool. Um, if you're trying to overwinter your pepper um, and they want to take that challenge on, are you supposed to, at the end of the season, trim back all the leaves? Do you leave them on, bring them inside? Like maybe like a first quick tip to get that started? Uh, I would not trim the leaves off, no. Uh, okay. if, if you can bring them inside, um, put them in a, you know, a sunny window, 
uh, and ideally they will keep their leaves during the winter. Um, uh, I uh, this this one, for instance, which lost its leaves, was inside, but it was in a cool spot that wasn't heated. Um, so it probably got down below 50 degrees um, during the night uh, and it survived that. But in your house, you probably keep your house warmer than 50 degrees during the night, at least a little bit. And uh, so they might very well keep their leaves all through the winter. And that's ideal. They should, uh, they're an evergreen plant uh, and a perennial. And uh, in, in a tropical climate, they would be green year round. Cool. Yeah, I would also suggest, you know, if you're going to bring any plants, but especially like veggies and stuff from the outside into your inside, check on it, make sure there's no bugs coming around, make sure your soil's okay. And sometimes that's an easy way for pathogens and bugs to get into your house. <laughs> um, but cool, that's a, that's a good idea. Um, also, similarly with Lila, with that question, um, trimming them in general, should you look into pruning them at certain times during the season to help increase their growth in certain ways or just kind of let them grow out? We'll let them grow out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, since they make flowers terminally on the branches, they have to branch out. They don't have any choice. Um, once they've bloomed, the, that branch can't grow any further unless it sends out side shoots. So mm -hmm. let that happen. Uh, now, there might be a circumstance where a plant maybe has been over fertilized and has grown bigger than you want it to get, and then you might have to trim it back. Um, but generally speaking, day length, I mean, just about this time of the year, they're being signaled that it's time to flower. And even the little guys are doing that. They don't have any choice. The, the genes inside them are telling them it's May, start flowering, start making fruit. Um, so, uh, generally speaking, you won't have to do really any pruning at all. Uh, if, if something dies uh, or gets broken, then you want to trim that neatly um, so that it can heal or at least not be a place that pathogens can, can enter the plant easily. Um, but, but other than you know breakage or the oddball branch suddenly dying for some unknown reason, um, really not much to do.